Welcome back to my dad's podcast, season two, My Black is Transnational. Follow him on Twitter and Instagram. Hope you enjoy the show. Bye! You are listening to my Black is Transnational. My name is Dr. Kalechi Bain Lambert. And coming up on this episode, I'll be having a conversation about black unity and white supremacy with a brother named Brother Hassan, um, who is very passionate about Haiti, very passionate about African history, considers himself an African griot. And we have a really deep conversation about white supremacy and black unity and why it's important for us to unify as black people, um, among other things, especially we, we touch on Haiti a little bit. Um, but before we get into those, uh, if this is your first time listening to My Black is Transnational, you can find this podcast on any of your favorite podcast listening platforms. You can find it on Apple, Google, Stitcher, Anchor, wherever you like to listen to good podcast. You can find this podcast in its entirety on there as well. If you want to learn more about this podcast, you can go on our website at www.blacktransnational.wixsite.com slash podcast. You can also check us out on Instagram. We're primarily on Instagram at Black Transnational Podcast, or you can follow me, the host, at Black Transnational underscore. All right. And if you want to email us, you can definitely email us at blacktransnational17 at gmail.com. If you're ever interested in being a guest on the show or being part of our Let's Just segments or whatever you want to do, however you want to interact with me, I am available. You have all the information out there. We're actually on Twitter as well, but we have been lacking on Twitter. I've been saying it almost every season, um, but we are there at MB Transnational. All right. So, again, you know, this conversation that I have with our guests for this episode is a very interesting one. And it was a rather unfortunate timing of things where, you know, we had a conversation when this was recorded, we had a conversation about white supremacy and all that, but this was in Vietnam Lou before the news broke out about um, the young man, you know, Ahmaud Arbery, who was murdered, who was lynched um, by some white supremacist in February. And the news just came out recently um, and it's becoming a trending thing. And it's, you know, we don't necessarily talk about the violence that comes with it. You know, we really talk more about the strategic manipulations of black people um, by the majority um, and how black people psychologically are impacted. Uh, We talk a a lot about Haiti, Haiti, for those who are from there. And he has, you know, bloodlines connected to Haiti and you know, we really talk about just the impact of him going back there and why it motivated his experience and upbringing and his passion for African history, um, for for unity, for black unity. Well, he uses the term getting on code uh, as far as black people being able to be aware, to be um, to be very active. Right. And he talks about his process of how he transitions from being a youth who's going down the wrong path and how he finds himself through education, through knowledge and is trying to give back you know, through his advocacy. Um, so a very interesting conversation f- during some really, really somber times right now for black people. Um, but it's very important to understand that you know, we have to be a lot more vocal. We have to be a lot more active when it comes to these things. Obviously, people feel like they can just go down and hunt us. Hunting season is, is open. And that's unfortunate. So let's not just watch these things go idly by. Let's really take this conversation that I have and apply it to what we are currently experiencing. And I hope that we are able to at least, you know, for whatever it's worth, um, I don't think we should respond with anger. Um, And I even think some of y'all may find this conversation and what Brother Hassan says to be a little bit um, aggressive you know, in a sense, or a little bit radical, and I like it, you know, I think there's a different perspective that's added to this podcast, but I think there's something that we can definitely take out of it as far as what we need to do as unifying as as black nations, as black people, as black communities, all right, so I'll stop rambling, I'm going to use this opportunity to segue, 
So without any further ado, here's my conversation with Brother Hassan. Enjoy. Hello, everyone. Welcome to my Black is Transnational. And for today's episode, we have on our guest who came to me highly recommended by many people who have been listening to the show. And I first and foremost want to thank those who've been listening, who have been recommending this brother um, for the recommendation. We're very excited to have on the show uh, Brother Hassan, who is um, an African griot, you know, very an enthusiast of the African history and really an enthusiast for the Haitian history, Haitian culture, and will be talking with us about how the psychological effects of um, of the Haitian people or African, fellow Africans in the diaspora, how it has um, played a major role um, that's connected to our history. So welcome, Brother Hassan. How you doing? I'm good, brother. Peace, peace, Black family. Peace, peace to you too, bro. Um, So first and foremost, before we get into the conversation, I just want you to have a moment to just introduce yourself to the listeners, for those who may not know who you are, let them know your background, your, you know, who you are, what you do, what your passion is. Okay, so uh, again, I'm a, my name is Brother Hassan. I'm from uh, Miami, Florida. Uh, my mother is from the island of Haiti, which is Haiti. Uh, my father is also from Haiti, but his father is from Benin. And so my grandfather was a, a Yoruba man uh, from Benin who actually migrated to Haiti, to Haiti, um, in about the 50s, I believe. You said in the 50s? Uh, yeah, I believe he migrated in the 50s or the 40s to IET. And, uh, you know, starting a uh, new life, escaping one area to another area. Right. And um, I was born and raised again in Miami. Um, I'm a 10th grade dropout, uh, seven-time felon. Uh, I like to consider myself to be the Malcolm X of the South. Someone who was headed down the wrong path, um, you know, involved in a lot of nefarious things uh, as a youth. Mm -hmm. And then one day some information was presented to me um, on how we were being manufactured as African people to be and act and uh, conduct ourselves in a certain manner. And so that led me to Dr. Francis Cress Welsing, that led me to Nellie Fuller and uh, Dr. Amos Wilson. And so... From then, my life began to change, kind of like Malcolm X's life, where I began to see some of the things that, you know, I was behaving in and, you know, the way that I was uh, conducting myself was all an orchestrated plot since the very conception of my birth. And so that's just a, a, a brief history about me. I've been fighting to educate my people, um, uh, to liberate our minds, because any form of liberation starts with our thinking first. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things I've been doing on the ground uh, as far as educating people any way possible. It doesn't matter. Podcasts, um, talking to people on the streets, uh, um, talking in schools, any way possible. And that's what I've been dedicated to the past 11 years of my life. Oh, that's that's dope, bro. And I really appreciate, you know, the the authenticity in, in you expressing your background and, and who you are and, and just kind of expressing the change, the turnaround. You know, I think that's really good. Um, and I want to, I'm going to, we're going to kind of unpack that a little bit in a few, but I want to talk about the, um, I want to talk a little bit more about your connection with Haiti, right? You said that your, your family, your mother's from there, your father was raised there. Um, what's your connection? Do you travel to Haiti often? You know, have you visited before? You know, being in Miami, it's really close. I lived in Florida not that long ago, so I know how it goes, but, um, I want you to, you know, let me know how that interaction is like, you know, with being in a, in your father's country compared to being in the U.S. Okay, so um, being the fact that I'm in my my mid thirties now, I recently just traveled to Haiti for the first time in my in my life, actually, and that's because of the psychological um, mind fuck. May I curse? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Take, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so the psychological mind twist, let me change that, mind twist that we've been put on, you know, most Haitians, um, when they're raising their children, they, you know, have um, these negative things to say about Haiti. You know, they always say that, you know, someone's going to put voodoo on you. It's like one of the things that, you know, you hear about Haitians, they do voodoo. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of us, um, first generation Haitians, grow up with a negative opinion of Haiti or a fear of Haiti mm -hmm. or Haitian people, Right. You know, they tell us, don't eat from anyone or, you know, don't, you know, let somebody get a picture of you. And so I was very scared of traveling to 
Haiti. Now, mind you, I've been everywhere in the world. Like, I've been, I traveled a few places in the world. And I never thought about going to Haiti because I was so scared of Haiti. But I met a friend recently, and she was like, look, put all that to the side. That's shenanigans. We're going to go to Haiti. So a group of us actually went to Haiti, um, stepped foot on the ground. We, we did some things in the orphanage, and um, we traveled around, seen some historical spots, and it was it was mind-blowing, man. It's beautiful. And every place you go to, and I want the listeners to really take this in consideration, everywhere you go, there's going to be beauty, and everywhere you go, there's going to be some horrible things, right? Even in America. Yep. You go to New Orleans, there's slums in New Orleans. You go to Texas, you go to New York, there's beauty in everything, right? And so Haiti was the same thing. Haiti was like some spots were breathtaking. I mean, just breathtaking. And then you have this poor areas as well, man. But um, the people were welcoming. You know, my Creole isn't the sharpest, but the people were welcoming. They were very assisting. You know, I didn't feel um, threatened at any time. You know, um, it was just a beautiful experience, man, for a first time, you know, Haitian person going to Haiti. You plan on going back? Definitely, definitely. I'm not going to lie to you. There's a um, a place called the Citadel, uh-huh. and it's in Cap Haitian, which is in the, which is in the northern part, and it's actually the the biggest um, structure in the Western Hemisphere, like a, a fortress in the Western Hemisphere. There isn't anything like it. It's on top of a mountain. It takes two hours to get up there. Mm-hmm. And that did something to me walking up that mountain, knowing that my ancestors mm-hmm. took 12 years to build this castle, this fortress. And, you know, the whole time I was walking up there, I was like, man, think how brutal slavery would have to be that every day you'll walk two hours up a mountain with bricks on your back to build this fortress. And so I think, you know, the same way that Jewish people have their, you know, pillage that they got to go back to Israel and, you know, and then the Mecca where the Muslims go back to walk around the rock. I think every African, right, in the diaspora should go back to their homeland and, and visit a historical site and pay homage to their ancestors. So I'm definitely going to go back every chance I get. Absolutely, man. That's beautiful to hear. And, you know, and for, for one, hey. Haiti has such a rich, beautiful history, and especially for being, you know, the only black country to self-liberate themselves. You know what I mean? From slavery, it's 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 powerful. You know, even what you just mentioned as far as the citadel, to to go back there and to be able to see that and be able to have those connections, it, it makes you realize that there's so much more than what you see in the US, right? Like there's so much beyond what we experience here in the States sometimes that when we go back home and, and, you know, I've had a similar experience um, as far as having family members. I was born in Nigeria, but even when, you know, I had other family members who were living in, in other countries, that fear of not going back because of this, that, and the third, because of, you know, whether it's someone's going to rob you or someone's going to do voodoo or, you know, whatever the case may be, I encourage everyone, as you mentioned, to not let that stop you. Make the right connections properly prepare yourself and connect back to your homeland. Um, but let's segue into your, your your passion when it comes to the African history and the psychological effect. Like what led you to become this educator? Why so passionate about Haiti and, and African history? Why use that as your tool? Okay, so let me backtrack for a second uh, into what you said earlier about Haiti being the um, black uh, place to free themselves from slavery. That is the only time in history that a group of people were slaves and they became the ruling class. So white or black, that is the Spartan couldn't do it, the Greeks couldn't do it. That is the only time where a group of people were slaves and became the masters of the land that they were slaves on. I just want to throw that out there because a lot of people don't understand the magnitude of that. They think it's just, you know, oh, what was the first black empire, first black republic? No, it's the only time in history that it has been done. But what brought me to um, using education? I realized that we were being miseducated, right? Um, Like reading books by Carter G. Woodson, Mm -hmm. The Miseducation of the Negro, where he talks about how the educated Negro isn't any assistance to their own community because once they receive their their form of education, they leave that community to never come back, Mm -hmm. right? And so that led me to other books, you know, um, W.E. Du Bois, The Soul of Black Folk. When he talks about double consciousness, mm-hmm. how it's a psychological phenomenon of seeing the world through the eyes of your oppressor. So we see our hair texture, our skin color, our relationships, 
you know, our clothing through the eyes of our oppressor. So when we're seeing our people skin bleaching, it's because they see it through the eyes of the oppressor. Mm-hmm. When we see our people in the continent or the Caribbean, you know, value speaking French or Portugal over speaking their native tongue, that's because we see that through the eyes of our oppressor. And so all those things begin to make sense. And those things also translate into how we deal with each other. So if I don't, if I see you through the eyes of the oppressor, then I don't value you as a brother. Mm-hmm. And I'll be quick to say, you fucking nigga, mm-hmm. I'll kill you. Mm-hmm. Because I see you through the eyes of the oppressor. Or, or you know, I'm quick to be uh, xenophobic to other Africans coming into my area. Oh, this is not for, you know, Nigerians. This is for South Africans or vice versa, mm-hmm. right? So once I begin to realize those things, I realize that we have been miseducated for the purpose of white supremacy or white domination. And so that's what kind of led me down the path to, you know, realize it. Because as a child, you grew up and you wonder, why do we hate each other so much? Why does black on black, black on black violence exist? Mm-hmm. But again, all violence exists in all races. But I'm just saying specifically for black people. Or why do we hate each other? Why black celebrities in Europe and in America, every time they get money, they marry someone white? So all those things exist in our minds. Some of us, you know, may not vocalize it as much, but we all think those things. Mm-hmm. And so I began to think, like, well, why does this exist? Why do we have this self hatred? And that's what kept on leading me to. Oh, we've been miseducated for a purpose. You know, Dr. Amos Wilson said, it's, if you want to understand any problem in society, don't look at who suffers from the problem. Look at who benefits from the problem. So when we look at black, black violence, when we look at mass incarceration, when we look at the continent of Africa being underdeveloped, we know that it is it has all the natural resources. Let's not look at Africa. Let's look at the people who's benefiting from Africa being underdeveloped. So all those things begin to make sense. And it begins to shape my opinions and viewpoints of the world. And, I, and that's led me to what I am here today. Forgive me, I know I'm speaking fast, family. I know I'm going fast, so I try to get as much in as possible. Listen, man, we got we got enough time. You ain't got to rush it. We we gonna we gonna capture okay. whatever we need to capture, brother. Don't even worry about that. Because I think I think you're rolling onto something that's very important. You know, especially when we talk about the idea of the the way we look at each other. Right. Let's not even I mean, we understand the, the who the oppressor is, but let's look at it from let's talk about it on the level where we're, we're both in as far as being both black um, and thinking about that idea of the xenophobia that exists. And, and I say that because the xenophobia, we, you know, you, you hear about it primarily when it came to the issue related to South Africa and Nigerians. But this xenophobia exists in the United States, right? And I want to, and even in Europe, in London, and in, in France, and all the other places where Black people um, immigrate to. And I think it's important to mention that because I, one of the things that you know this podcast really tries to enlighten people about is the relationship between Black immigrants and Native African Americans, and that you know, for someone like for someone such as yourself who has um Haitian family, Haitian bloodlines. You know, I want to know what your experience was like as far as how your family um, described the African Americans compared to Black immigrants, Caribbean immigrants. Was there a distinguished um, identification, or did you grow up just being Black? Like, I want to know what your experience was as far as identifying that difference between both groups. Okay, so early on in my childhood, we moved to Virginia. So my family, my family made it here from Haiti. And then I was born here in the States. And so we ended up in Virginia. So my earliest memories would be of being in Virginia. Mm -hmm. And my mom didn't speak any English. Uh, My dad, not so much as well. But there was a a woman, I can't remember her name. I think it was Sarah. But there was a woman who was very Afrocentric. And she always used to wear African clothing. She was an Mm African-American. And she basically took my mother in as far as, like, helping her get a job at Denny's, showing her how to, you know, drive and things like that. She was very influential in my mother's growth from being, you know, an immigrant. And so, um, you know, she, but she was very Afrocentric. See, here's the thing. When you don't have a connection to your Africanness, then, of course, the xenophobia will exist inside of you. Mm-hmm. But this this woman was connected to her Africanness. Even though she was a five-generational African-American, she was still connected then we end up moving to Miami um, early on, right? Mm-hmm. And it wasn't the same experience. Um, Florida has a, a different vibe than a lot, of, a lot of different states. Who are you telling? Um, 
Yeah. Florida is there is something in the water in Florida. Right. So uh, <laughs> we we moved out here and automatically um the neighborhood of Little Haiti was already created. And um, you know, that was done that was done by of course the white supremacists, you know, orchestrating things. And we were directly across um literally I ninety five separates Little Haiti and Liberty City. Liberty City will be uh, African Americans. Little Haiti would be primarily uh, Haitian. Mm-hmm. And they all went to one school, which was Edison. It's like kind of right in the middle. And in the 80s and the 90s, man, it was horrible. It was terrible. It was a lot of um, picking, mm-hmm. a lot of uh, violence, and, um, you know, just a lot of uh, uh, stereotypes about us, which was coming from the, the media. Mm-hmm. See, the thing about it is, is that... Um, the media was, was, instead of us getting to know each other, the media was our median. Yes. So the media was telling us what what it is about African Americans and what you should know about Haitians. Mm-hmm. Haitians got AIDS. Haitians come from voodoo. And African Americans, same thing. Oh, African Americans are lazy. African Americans are dirty. So we allowed the media to shape our opinions of each other. And then that created more of, of a divide. <laughs> Right, mm-hmm. and a lot of things. A lot of things that I noticed too early on as a child, which play in my mind now, is that a lot of white missionaries would come to my house and other Haitians' house to give out clothes and do things like that. And so now they're grooming the the Haitians to say, "Hey, look, we're your friends. You know, we're here for you. You know, we're here in the name of Christ." Mm-hmm. Right, and. A lot of times this creates a type of subservient behavior in us mm-hmm. when we come from different countries and we come to America and we say, hey, look, when I got here, I didn't have anything. And a white person gave me this, a white person gave me that. But as a child, I always, me personally, I'm saying my personal experience, I always remember that black woman, which I think her name was Sarah, I can't really remember her name, that did to my mother when we first got here. Mm-hmm. So I didn't have that experience with the, the white people coming to my house. But it happens, though. Um, but to answer your question... Um, it wasn't too good. The communication and the uh, connection between African Americans and Haitians was horrible. There are some parallels that you described in that answer that really aligns with very similar experiences from the African um, immigrant perspective, and not you know from those from the diaspora of the islands as far as that perception. And I think that that speaks to a commonality, right? To a common source of it being the media, because that perception that African Americans are lazy. Right, they're violent. Right, they're brutal. Um, mm-hmm. you know, and and they they cannot be they cannot be domesticated or they can't be taught they can't be civilized. I mean, that is something that a lot of my my peoples coming from Niger, like they had that perception, you know. And 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 I think you speak to something even even more deeper as far as that grooming perspective. And I want I'm going to ask you a little bit about what's going on in your opinion in Haiti in a little bit, but I still want to continue with this train of thought. But that whole idea of you know, white people being the first ones that were nice to me. You get me? Mm-hmm. Like that first they were the I mean, that is so common, bro. Like I've had conversations where it's, you know, the first experience that an African or a black immigrant had when it came to America, the people who embraced them were the white ones, right? And that leads to some level of affinity with white people, right? Mm -hmm. And the research will show that a lot of Black immigrants tend to disassociate themselves from Native African Americans, and it's a term they call downward assimilation, right? Which is the idea of not wanting to associate yourself with this particular group because it brings down your overall value because you immigrated for the pursuit of affluence and you associating yourself with this group will essentially hurt you, right? It, so it puts you in this group where you will not be able to achieve your set goal, right? And I think you kind of hinting at that whole thing as far as the missionaries coming in and doing this, and I'm sure their intentions were well and good, but there's something behind that as to how it helps, <laughs> as to as to how it you know shapes how we see our fellow brothers and sisters that are literally across the street. You know what I'm saying? Right. So so that's that's very powerful, man. And um and I appreciate you sharing that. It's just I just found the commonality so so deep. Well, you know what? This might upset upset a lot of your listeners. But I am one who firmly believes that there is no such thing as a good white person. And <laughs> now I, I got to be frank about this, right? Be real, be real. So, speak your truth. 
no, I, I got to be 100% frank about this. So when these missionaries come in and do this work, when they come in to do work for immigrant people, right, or they go to Nigeria to do work in Nigeria or in Haiti, right, mm-hmm. one must ask themselves, do you not have a population of blacks who need your help in America? Why is it that you would skip over black Americans to help a Caribbean person? It is because they have not personally had that connection or that history of mistreating these people in America. So you're coming to a group of Africans who have fresh eyes for you, right? Mm. Because African-Americans, they already feel like you slighted me for five generations. Mm. You hurt my family for five generations. So no matter what good you try to do to me or for me, I'm still going to look at you with sideways eyes. So they feel that they have a better chance of brainwashing fresh African eyes. And this is why they'll skip over New Orleans. They'll skip over the Bronx. They'll skip over anywhere and go way to another continent to try to clean their their uh, um, perception or clean someone's perception of who and what they really are. It's not because they really care. It's not because they, 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 they have a liberal, greenest, leading heart. It's because... They want to maintain that idea that whiteness is good. Mm-hmm. And as many as many Africans, they can convert to, uh, and I don't want to say a cool, but being misguided, then that, that creates a buffer zone, right? Because when we begin to say, you know what, white people are really tricky. There's going to be an African that's going to say, no, 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 no. This white guy actually did something for me. And it's like, no, we're trying to get on code. We're trying to, to create a narrative here. And you're always going to have that buffer zone of Africans, whether from the Caribbean or from the continent, that have been helped by white people. And so that's why white people do it, not because they really care. Mm-hmm. They want to create a buffer class so we can fight amongst each other. It's real, though, bro. I mean, I can't, I can't, you know, <laughs> and I say that because when I came here as a shorty, when I came to the States in 1997, um, that was that was as, as naive as I was. I will say that that was kind of it, right? Like, it was like, yo, the white people are the good guys. Cause you see it, you see it everywhere, bro. Like you see it in the, you see it in the movies, right? You see it, you know, in the cartoons, you see, you know, this is, we already know that everything was meticulously placed as far as how, you know, when it comes to the colorism, how we see one group versus the other. And obviously I'm saying all this in retrospect, but that's my perspective when I was a kid, right? It was like, Man, like the white people are the good guys, right? Like they're so cool, they're nice, right? Even when it comes to how we perceive beauty, the standard of beauty, right? Like all those things, it that that you have to that's miseducation, but that's also one of those things you have to like unlearn. You know what I mean? Like we have to unlearn all those things in order to truly appreciate, as you've mentioned already, all the natural gifts and resources that we as black people have. Right. And, and, and the power, and I always say this in almost every episode of conversation, the power that we have when we all come together as black, whether we're from the continent, the islands, and even in the States, when we come together, that is one of the most powerful things that no white person wants to see. So I wouldn't be surprised if they're trying to get ahead of the game, if they condition, <laughs> if they've conditioned themselves to want to reach out to their other, to that other group and let them know that, hey, you know, give us that buffer. Like, we're good. Give us the slack. Cut us some slack if we, if you see something about, you know, if you hear something about some dudes wearing, you know, um, a white mask or whatever, right? Like, no, that's not really us. That's our past. Like, we're good. You know what I mean? So, like, I can, I, I feel you on that, bro. Oh, yeah. They, they don't, they, they are very strategic people. Um, you know, one thing I always try to make our people um, see is that, White people have what are called think tanks, where they sit down and they project 10 years, 20 years into the future. When they come to gentrify a neighborhood, they don't do this overnight. This is something they've been thinking about 10 or 15 years down the line. Mm -hmm. It may hit you overnight, but it's something that they've been projecting. So as African people, we don't have any think tanks. All we have is reactionary tanks. Mm -hmm. We react to white supremacy, right? Mm -hmm. But these people actually sit around for years and say, we're going to move in on this neighborhood. We're going to do this. So for one to say, oh, well, you know, I don't really think that they do things like that. Like, I think they do it from their heart. I met a white missionary one time, and he told me that his write-offs are amazing Mm -hmm. because he donates so much. You know, and he donates used stuff, stuff that he's not going to use anymore and clothes, and he donates used stuff, and he gets amazing write-offs. So, it, I mean, 
it's self-explanatory. When you really <laughs> dig deep into it, it's truly self-explanatory. They, they don't do anything from a, a genuine, you know, point of view. Everything is about power, about domination, about manipulation. You know, this is why some of their favorite books are uh, the 48 Laws of Power, mm. right? When you begin to read that, you see that's a European mindset yeah. to say that, you know, they have a European constant. There's a, there's a quote by a French uh, gentleman. I can't think of his name. He says, the more things change, the more they stay the same, mm. right? And so, so the more we can, you know, make things seem like they're changing on a surface level, the more we can keep things the same, you know, uh, behind the scenes mm. where people don't see that the power structure hasn't changed. So, you know, something that Dr. Amos Wilson says, he says, how is it, uh, how has your relationship changed uh, from our ancestors? And he said it hasn't. In the past 500 years, the relationships between blacks and Europeans haven't changed at all. Militarily, educationally, you know, employment-wise, our relationship hasn't changed. We still go to school, right before then we didn't go to school, but we'll go to school and then work for the better interests of white people, you know, on the plantation. Same thing. You know, what is the difference between the, um, the, the auction block, right, where you're being sold as a slave, and a job interview? Before... The auctioneer would say, hey, we got a big buck right here. He can lift 200 pounds. He's a fast runner. He can take all the cotton you need. Now we go into these jobs and we sell ourselves to them and say, hey, I can type 100 something words an hour. I can, you know, uh, make coffee. I can do whatever you need me to do. You know, so the relationship hasn't changed between Africans and Europeans in the past 500 years at all. I want to take it back because I think I want to segue as far as that that past 500 years. And I want to speak a little bit more about what your thoughts are related to the history that happened in Haiti and and how the, what are these psychological effects like what do you think are some primary psychological effects that are impacting you know black people africans you know whether it's in Haiti whether it's in it's in the states like what are some things that are affecting us right now that we need to be aware of um i think Definitely double consciousness would be the, the number one on my list, mm. how we view ourselves and how we perceive ourselves. Um, after that, I would go with Stockholm Syndrome, mm. right? Because since we've been so abused by these people, um, whether through media, uh, physically, um, a lot of times we find it in our hearts to feel some type of compassion for them, even though they're abusing us. Mm. Um Cultural assimilation would definitely be one uh, where you see that we make it into these communities. And, you know, there's a, you know, let me just say this right quick. When you look at the Latino culture, right, mm -hmm. most children of my age, mid-30s, they can speak and also write in Spanish because, you know, the Spanish people are like, they're like, hey, look, we're going to teach our children everything they need to know about Spanish culture. Mm -hmm. Most Haitians and most constantly Africans that come to America after the first generation of being here, they really can't speak their native tongue. Mm. They're, they're sort of assimilated to the American, you know, um, culture. Mm. And so there's a lot of uh, psychological issues that we face. Um, Dr. Francis said, Dr. Francis Cress Wilson says that, you know, one of the biggest psychological issues that we face is living under a system of white supremacy. And so uh, there, there's, there's a lot dealing with the religion as far as uh, cultural assimilation as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, being the fact that we are the only people, to my knowledge, uh, who pray to a God that doesn't look like us. Mm -hmm. You know, so. I mean, there are lots of things. Yeah. There are lots of things. Um, and I want to just kind of follow up that question and ask you, what is... What do you think is a possible solution or at least a way to address these, the double consciousness um, and um, everything that you listed already? Well, I, well, let me just say this. I am not under the illusion that all African people will be saved mm. um, because some of us are just too far gone. And that's sad, but it's the reality. Some of us have faced some very uh, um, traumatic hits to the head from white supremacy. And, you know, you even have some black people who tattoo swastikas on them and, and, and white power, wow. you know? Um, so those folks, no matter how much you show them how demonic this system is or how demonic white people have been, 
they will always find the silver lining. Um, but I think the solution to those who want to be saved or those who may not know that they're in trouble, because I, I often say this, fish don't know that they're in water until they're out of water. And so being the fact that we were born into this system of white supremacy, we don't see anything wrong with worshiping the white Jesus. We don't see anything wrong with having European last names. We don't see anything wrong with, you know, perming our hair when it has so much chemicals or we're walking around with blonde wigs on our hair or, you know, um, marrying women outside of our race when, when it was black women who nurtured us from the beginning of time, right? So mm-hmm. since we were born into this system of white supremacy, we necessarily don't know we're out of water until we're out of water. And so um, I say that it has to be the African who wants to change or who who already sees that there's a problem with the way that they behave. And um, it's, it starts with that because it's kind of like Alcohol Anonymous, right? So one of the first things, you know, they make you do is they say, hey, everybody, my name is Brother Hassan, and I'm an alcoholic. Mm-hmm. So the first step is admitting that there's a problem. And as African people, we can't even admit that we're subjugated. We can't even admit that, you know, we're living under a vile, disgusting white supremacist system. Then there is no changing and there is no no finding a solution for that. I think, you know, one of the things you mentioned in there that really resonates with me is though that idea of black people not not passing on the language and the culture. And that's that's essentially what this podcast is really emphasizing and and we use the term transnationalism because we're talking about people who are navigating both worlds right you you have people who've immigrated and are here and are and are kind of gaining whatever they can gain from the you know the experience here in the United States but that connection to their native homeland is supposed to kind of serve as that um that preservative or even that barrier that kind of minimizes that assimilation or resist it, I should say, is resistance is probably the better word, um, to kind of resist the full-blown assimilation that happens where you lose the language. But some way, somehow, people tend to do that. Um, and, and as far as, you know, it, I think that's one of the possible solutions to what you've already mentioned uh, as for Black people. I want to know what you think about what's going on in, in Haiti. Like, what are some issues in there that people should be aware about who may be Haitian, but may not have a connection with their homeland um, or people who may be from the islands and may experience something similar? What are some issues that we need to be aware of that's going on in the islands with our people there? Do you know? Well, so dealing with Haiti in particular, um, since 1804, uh, when Haiti gained its independence to become the first um, black Republic or empire, um, there has been an attack from all European nations. There's a book called uh, Canada in Haiti, very disgusting book. Talks a lot about the atrocities that Canada perpetrated in Haiti. But the number one uh, agenda um, of white supremacy since 1804 is to run that country into the ground. It's to run its people into the ground. It's to destroy the people. There's a quote from... Uh, what is his brother's name? There's a quote from a gentleman. I can't think of his name right now. But he says in his book, uh, David Walker. That's his name, David Walker. David David Walker's Appeal is the book. He says in his book in 1826, he says that Haiti should be aware of, no, Haiti is the glory of black, of the black race, right? And Haiti should be aware of white people coming to, to Haiti because they will destroy Haiti if they get the chance to destroy Haiti. Because Haiti has been an example for black people, right? If you actually look at the red, black, and green flag, the red, black, and green flag is nothing more than a cutoff from the first Haitian flag, because the first Haitian flag is actually black and red, the first original Haitian flag, not the one we see today. And so when you go to places like Durham, North Carolina, you will see there was a little small community called Haiti. Right, and there's also another one in Missouri. When you look at a lot of the revolutions that took place, like in Louisiana, you know, you had revolutions that took place with Haitian people. Haiti has always been an example. The Black Panthers talked about Haiti. Um, you know, the Mau Mau in Kenya, they used the Haitian techniques of scorched earth when they were fighting um, for independence, right? Mm-hmm. And so the Haitian Revolution has always been like a 
a, 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 a match in the back of black people. And so white supremacists said, listen, we have to destroy this country. We have to totally annihilate it. And that's what they've been doing ever since then. Now, you've had Haiti's, you had some times in, in Haitian history where you had people like Papa Doc, who was very anti American, you know, who was very strategic with them, but he also, you know, did some atrocities and things like that in the country. Um, but right now, at this point, you have a puppet government. You know, I just want to do it modern day. You have a puppet government in office that is allowing America to drill offshore for, uh, for gold and for oil and you know, they allow the U.S. Marines in there to come, not the Marines, the uh, U.N., to do just atrocities to the people and things like that. So um, anywhere the African people are, we're going to be attacked. But primarily, they're literally trying to destroy Haiti. To just, you know, that's, that, I'll give you an example. I remember I posted something about Haiti, about Haitian Heritage Day. And the first thing a white person came on my page and said, oh, you're talking about the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere? And that's what the attack is about, because when you when you when you have pride, when you can look to a country, or you can look to a place and say, "Look what we did." White supremacy can't have that because their self esteem is based off of our degradation. Their self esteem is based off of us running it, being run into the ground. So when you look at a Kwame Nkrumah, and you see how he tried to unite Africa, and you know he was doing what he was doing in Ghana, and he didn't even last what, no more than two or three years, and he, and he already had a coup? When you look at an Idi Amin of Uganda, mm. right? When you look at a Patrice Lumumba in, in Congo, you know, or you look at a, a Narendra, uh, I always pronounce his name wrong, of Nigeria, mm. uh, Dr. Uh, I can't pronounce his name, but the first, the first uh, leader of uh, Nigeria who mm. fought off the British and things like that, mm. right? When you look at these people and how they got taken out of power and how you understand what the initial thing is. It's to destroy African people no matter where we are. So whatever can be said about Haiti, we can say the same thing about Ghana, Nigeria, Turks and Caicos, South Africa. You know, it's always a run them niggas into the ground and don't let them succeed. I, I, I'll say this. Let me just say this. And I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. No, go ahead, I'll go just ahead. say this. It's not... There isn't a coincidence that everywhere you go where black people are that white people are either over us socially, right, or the country can't maintain um, some form of social stability. Mm. Nowhere you go, everywhere you go, you're telling me out of all these millions of Africans, we're all incompetent, mm -mm. Or, or, or somebody's going to trip on us. Mm. Because you can't point to one country where you can say, man, those Africans are thriving. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, <laughs> that's very gloomy. I mean, that's a very gloomy but true statement. You know what I mean? Because even as you were talking, I, I just kind of said out loud, like the only the only thriving country, black country, is Wakanda. Wakanda is not even real. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, like it's fictional. You know what I mean? Like, the, so that means that right. the, the, to imagine African African countries thriving is only a figment of our imagination that had to be created by Marvel. You know, and that's. You, do you remember? I'm sorry. Do you remember? How upset white people were when Wakanda when the movie was coming out. Oh, they were but because even even the idea of black people thriving bothered them. But hurt they were but hurt. But hurt. But hurt. And so that's what we must understand. There's no there's no coincidence that Guinea was destroyed when when um these people begin to leave Guinea. There, there's no coincidence in this. This is all structured out white supremacy. We must destroy and keep you because they can't be who they are unless we are who we are. Mm. They can't be that. That is that's it. It's 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 um it's deep, man. <laughs> it's it's deep in a rap, bro. <laughs> you know, and and I and I think about it, and um and and I'm just like marveled. Be, no pun intended, but but I'm just thinking about like. <laughs> how crazy it is because when you think about all the countries in Africa, you know, and which one, <laughs> like which one, you know, that's, that's kind of what is leading me to pause right now. Cause I'm thinking about all the countries, right? Like in Mor Morocco, like Egypt, like Congo, I'm thinking about all the countries that I could think of, even Madagascar, like where, 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 where are they thriving? And without, and I'm like, none. I can't think of anything off the top of my head, which is, 
which is a shame. I mean, Ghana, yeah, you know, Nigeria, yeah, but even there, they, they, they're suffering a lot from the effects of colonialism, and that Stockholm syndrome is a big thing, not just for, you know, for slaves or descendants of slaves here in the States, but also for descendants of those who've, who've gone to colonialism, um, and that plays a major role. Um, but I think in order to, I want to know, like, with all this information, like, when you, when you were learning about this, you know, as you mentioned before, your history of dropping out and, and you, know, you know, kind of going through the, this, this winding road until you found yourself, you found a Malcolm X within you. How did you feel when you started to be, um, when you started to be enlightened and you started to learn all these things? Like, did you have a fire burning in you? Or like, what was your response when you started to become more educated in, in, in this whole thing? Um, I went through two levels of anger, right? And the first level of anger was being mad at white people, right? Mm -hmm. And the second level of anger was being mad at black people for not being mad at white people. After sitting around showing them, hey, look what they did to us. Look what they're doing to us. And then seeing that black people were like empathetic to it, like, oh, yeah, you know, it is what it is. That created the anger in me. So I went through those two stages, and then the, I guess the third stage was just being angry. I was just mad all the time because when you know that there's a game being played on you, but enough people are not reacting to the game, it kind of makes you be a part of the game. Like the situation that we're in right now, this whole coronavirus, right? Mm -hmm. You know, people like Garvey have come before us and told us that we need to be self-sufficient. We need to create a nation within a nation, or, you know, we need to be able to you know, if white people disappear tomorrow, we need to be able to maintain ourselves, right? People have been telling us for years, for years and years and years. And now we're in this global pandemic where the literally the people, the black people living within the states are at the mercy of white people. We're at the mercy of them to provide whatever they can provide for us because we haven't done so, right? And even other nation states, in Africa, are also dependent because with trade and things like that, you know, like I'm disgusted to find out that most of the fruit that we eat in the States come from Africa, but then they sell it back to Africa. That's disgusting. They grow the fruit in Africa, ship it over to Europe or ship it over to America, and then sell it back to Africa. You gotta be, you gotta be kidding me. That's disgusting. So I went through anger when I got to that point. And then there was a level where um, I stopped being, being more humble about it. And start realizing that this journey isn't for everybody. It's really not. It's really not. It's not for everybody. You, you have to take that with a grain of salt. If not, you're going to be stuck in an angry place. And then I think a lot of people in, in, who call themselves conscious or woke, they get stuck in an angry place, but at the second level. And the second level is being mad at black people. So you will see people who say they're conscious, they're woke, and then they'll cuss a black person out in a heartbeat. Oh, you stupid N-word. You don't know this. Oh, you dumb. You know, and they're, because they're stuck. They haven't made it to that third level of just accepting who wants it and who doesn't want it. And I want to know, as we, we kind of are wrapping up, um, I, I just kind of want to know, what would you, for those who are listening, because I know there might be some listeners who are like, okay, man, it's a whole lot of shit going on right now. And it's a whole <laughs> lot of things that you're dropping at me right now, bro. But what you want me to do? Like, what do you want me to do, fam? Like, I'm, I'm speaking as a listener, but I'm just saying there's some people I know for a fact who might be like, okay, so what? What can we do? Like, what can I do? What can I do myself? What can I do for my community? Like, what can we do to kind of make sure that we are not, you know, forgotten or we can be su sufficient? Like, what are some things that you think we can do? I mean, I want to have this conversation with you about what are some things that we can do for the next level? Well, we have to understand that we are all individuals in a social system. And so once we begin to understand that, we begin to, we should we should begin to understand how we should move within this social system. So I understand that every person I come in contact with, I'm shaping their opinion and I'm shaping their views, right? Mm -hmm. So if black people already have a negative viewpoint of each other, then I should be coming with a positive attitude to my black people, mm -hmm. right? It bothers me when I hear black people say, "Hey, bro, you so nice, are you so cool?" Because that leads me to believe that they haven't met too many black people like me. And so when we begin to move as individual vessels and we understand that we should be on cold with one another, meaning I'm not going to throw another black person under the bus. I'm not going to do anything that's going to go against my cultural values, right? Because we must understand also culture is a form of survival. Mm -hmm. Culture is survival. When you understand culture, 
that is a form of survival. Like right now, again, dealing with this um, phenomenon that we're dealing with, you know, this coronavirus thing, right? What have a lot of Africans do? They went back to their cultural stuff. Yeah, they yeah. start getting herbs and yeah. plants and things like that. Yeah. You know, but here in the West, they're like, oh, no, just, you know, we went for a vaccine. So culture is survival. So when we get back to understanding culture, when we get back to understanding relations with one another, you know, then we can move forward as a people. Because, again, they can only work. Europeans are only what? I think 5% of the world population. Mm. They can only work the best when they can create situations like um, Rwanda, where they can pit Hutu versus Tutsis. Mm-hmm. All right? And this is why they constantly get scared when we talk about unity. Yep. Because they understand that, that that threatens them, right? Yep. So be on cold with other African people. Be on cold. Even if you have ethnic differences, even if you have historical differences, be on cold. You don't necessarily have to throw every black person under the bus. That's what we like to do. We love to be the, the sacrificial lamb and just chop a black person down. Mm. You know, Nilly Fuller says, if you don't have anything constructive to do, right, then don't be around other black people if it's not constructive. And so one of the things that I've learned is if I'm not coming to your house to fix your car, to work on something and to do something, I don't come to your house because then that's that's too much free time. You know, if you're a Christian, they say that the, the, the devil, the devil time is idle time. Mm. So the more time you got, you're going to get you're going to get in trouble. I'm coming to your house. What are we going to do? We're going to drink. We're going to smoke. We're going to talk trash. And then at the end of that, we might get in a fight. So I don't have time for that. That when you act when you act military like that and you stay on code, right? Where I'm not coming to your house to bull jive or I'm not riding with you to bull jive, then that that minimizes the negative stuff that we get into, the negative comments we hear about each other. It minimizes. Because black people, we kinda lost the, the art of socialization. Mm. So just be on code. Stay on code. You know, it, you don't have to go around trying to save the world. Just stay on code. Be on code. And it'll work itself out. White people never, 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 never jeopardize the white race to save a black person. Even when you write and you asking the white person, aren't I right? Aren't I right? They'll look at you like, yeah, you're right, but I'm not going to agree with you against this white person. They will find, Dylan Roof will be the prime example. Dylan Roof went to the church and shot nine people, nine black people. I couldn't find one article where they condemned Dylan Roof. Oh, he, you know, he was a troubled kid. You know, he was, uh, you know, his mom got divorced. And they will find excuses even when they know that the white person is wrong. And that's what it's called. That's what it's called being on code. They are on code with each other. We are not. If a black person would have shot some white folks, another black person would have came on the news and said, that nigga needs to go to jail. Y'all need to kill him. That's not code. And even though I'm not justifying anybody killing anybody. But you, you, I'm throwing in the point, we have to be on cold. Stop throwing each other under the bus. You know, just to go back a little bit of colonial times. I know I'm, I'm, know I'm long-winded. You go back to colonial that. times, right? Um, a lot of people don't know how Africa was really taken over. You had, during that time period, a lot of Muslims that was in West Africa, right? And so a lot of times they were making deals with Arabs and making deals with the Europeans because of different faiths and different religions. Oh, he's practicing the Yoruba faith. I'm a Muslim. We don't believe in that. You know, let's let's sell them out. Or or let's do that. So we got we gotta be on code. Girl, and I think that's an that's an amazing way to end this discussion. And I and I and I do hope, and I sincerely say this, I do hope that people who are listening understand, you know, the whole concept, the importance of unity. Um, being a very, very, very powerful weapon that a lot of folks out there are scared of. Um, you know, you may not 100% agree or you may not 100% hate white people, and that's perfectly fine, but you have to understand that there are a lot of hidden agendas that a lot of us may not be aware of until we actually continue to delve into literature and information and, and, and good brothers like Brother Hassan who are passionate about this and here to educate, you know, us about what's going on um, among our people. You know what I'm saying? So, Brother Hassan, man, is there any way before, you know, we we truly um, end this, you know, thank you for just your time um, and your your energy and your passion. Is there any way that people can, you know, find you or, you know, you know, hear more of you or hear more from you? Uh, So on social media, it's always going to be Brother Hassan. But I've been deleted several times on social media, obviously because of my content and how unapologetically African I am. Mm-hmm. 
Um, so it's Brother Hassan, B R O T H A, right? Hassan with two S's, so H A S S A N. And right now it's Brother Hassan 3 because I'm actually on my third uh, uh, page, so that's with that number. Um, it's going to be Brother Hassan on everything on YouTube, on Facebook, on whatever I'm doing, it's always going to be Brother Hassan. Um, and that's it, man. I, I answer all DMs, you know. Um, I reach out to folk, folk reach out to me. And it's all about educating, man. I don't know everything, um, but I do know I have the best interest of African people in mind. And so that's that's what I always move with, the best interest. Before I do and say anything, I literally think, how is this going to affect the closest black person to me or how is it going to affect the black race? And when we begin to move like that, then everything else will fall in line. That's real, bro. That's real, man. Thank you so much for hopping on the show with me and, and chopping it up with me, man. I think we went way over what I thought, but I loved it, man. And um, and I, and I hope that we can have you on again in the near future, brother. No, brother, just throw out the black call. I'm there. Yeah, I heard that, bro. You have a good one, man. Likewise. So that's going to do it for this episode of My Black is Transnational. I'd like to thank Brother Hassan for joining us on this show. Um, I hope you all enjoyed the conversation that I had with Brother Hassan. Um, But before we truly close out, again, I just want to remind you all, as I mentioned in the beginning of this episode, to make sure that when it comes to the fight for justice against white supremacy, against violence against black people, we need to take a stand. Again, I hope that you all make the effort to um, support the people who are fighting for justice on behalf of Ahmaud Arbery. If you want to learn more about that, please go to www.runwithahmaud.com. R-U-N-W-I-T-H-M-A-U-D.com. All right, so please try your best to support, try your best to be informed, just do what you have to do in order to make sure that this never happens again. All right, so if you enjoyed what you heard and you want to hear more episodes, you can find this podcast on any of your favorite podcast listening apps. Uh, please check us out at www.blacktransnational.wixsite.com. You can follow us on Instagram at Black Transnational Podcast. You can follow me on Instagram at Black Transnational underscore. All right, so thank you all for listening. Until next time, my name is Dr. Kalechi Bay Lamberts. My Black is Transnational. And I hope by the end of this, yours will be too. Peace. Thank you.